My parents would drop me off down there and I'd go down there and watch in this old, old stand and um, was always just fascinated with how um, successful they were and what a great team they were. Christchurch United to us was probably like the Canterbury rugby team. It seemed to be our team that represented our province. It was one of the biggest educations you could possibly get. You know, I look back now, it's, it's, it's probably set me up. You know, it couldn't get any better. Nothing better than scoring goals and winning games. And once you get in that mentality in football, it just goes from strength to strength. There was no, no team ever outlasted us. Uh, it's, it's about determination, it's about grit. What you can't do is just give up. We felt we were invincible. You know, we didn't win every game, but we knew we could win every game. Just with your head. That's it. Come on, flick it up. Your footballers, eyes open. The story of Christchurch United Football Club is a story of highs and lows. From its heydays in the 70s and 80s, the club came close to extinction in the 90s and early 2000s. Today, it stands on the cusp of a new era. The club has a new vision and new ambitions, driven by a passionate football supporter. Slava Mine arrived in the city in 2009 and has spent the last eight years and millions of dollars creating a centre for footballing excellence in the city. Christchurch United finds itself transformed with state-of-the-art facilities and long-term aspirations which will see the club in the top tier of New Zealand football once again. Prodigal son Danny Halligan, once the midfield heart of Christchurch United, has led the team through the 2019 season to the promotion playoff game for the mainland Premier League. Concentrate, play percentages, and the opportunities there, strike. Right, and strike every time. Let's finish this one with a real 90 minute performance. Victory over Nelson FC will secure the first step on a long road back to the dominance which the club first enjoyed in the 1970s. I was a uh, very excited nine-year-old fan when Christchurch United formed in 1970 and I remember among the group of kids who followed football, we, um, we were really excited at you know, getting to see teams from Auckland and Wellington playing our team. This was the first league any sport had in New Zealand for a national competition like this. Every sport has them now, but this was something entirely new. It had been set up in the previous two or three years by representatives from the Christchurch City Club, the Rangers Club and the Shamrock and Technical Clubs. It had the goodwill pretty well of the whole football community in Christchurch behind it when it started. English Park was absolutely full when Blockhouse Bay and United took the field for the first match on the first day of the competition at English Park. It really was a, um, a great day for soccer. We got beaten 4-1, but uh, in that first year, we, I think we lost four or five games on the trot. I think we played Gisborne City. We never lost a game after that for the rest of the season. So we ended up in not a bad position. Amazing first season. As the 1970s were taking off, football in New Zealand was exploding in popularity. Christchurch United quickly established itself as one of the dominant clubs in the country, driven in large part by the ambition and huge personality of the club's second manager, Terry Conley. Terry was a genuine character. He had come out from England in the late 60s and coached New Brighton and Shamrock and then after the first National League season he was appointed United's coach. Terry is quite different, he was a personality, he wore a three-piece suit, he smoked cigars, he had whole court standing up on the benches at English Park in the dressing rooms after the games talking to the media. He had this great uh, relationship with a guy called Peter Doherty in the north of England at Preston North End and Peter Doherty was a Northern Ireland international, he had been at the 1958 World Cup. 
He was probably the greatest player Northern Ireland had ever had. He would gather up guys who hadn't quite made the grade as a professional. You know, you'd sign on as an apprentice professional and at 17 the club would decide whether they made you a full professional or not. Ian was one of the first to arrive. He, he came out and he, he had white boots and no one had white boots in New Zealand. <laughs> and he had these white boots and everybody called them, you know, what the hell's going on here? A Scotsman called Laurie Blythe, who's a great character. You know, he was uh, from Dundee, he was a pretty tough sort of uh, rooster. Got off the plane, it was a beautiful day. Uh, it was quite cold, but it was sunny. And I thought, well, if this is winter, compared with Dundee, this is like a summer's day. Went straight to the ground, the game was just starting. The referee got knocked out, two players got sent off, and the United won 2-0. So the comment that I made after was just like being back in Scotland. I had this three-piece suit on I, put, I wore on the day I left and about 36 hours later arrived in crisis I still had it on. I must have been ranked really in terms of uh, cleanliness and I had no career enhancement plans <laughs> whatsoever. The only enhancement plans that I had is for Bobby Armour to have a bloody good time while he's over here. And that was it. And play football. It was pretty exciting because uh, you know, a lot of them came out from England, they had English accents, uh, you know, they seemed to be more snappily dressed than uh, you know, the local guys and uh, they had uh, you know, um, girlfriends with exotic accents too. When they were all talking together I couldn't understand them. You know, a Scotsman talking amongst Scotsmen and Englishmen and Scotsmen trying to talk amongst themselves. It was very difficult. <laughs> when they arrived the, the, the level of training and the intensity of training um, just picked up straight away. The speed of the ball, the technique, the, the physicality of it, how strong they were. He knew he had quality players, didn't have to make them better, but his plan was, I'm going to make these boys the fittest team in the country. And it showed the success he had with those players was phenomenal. One thing I do remember about Terry's training and pre-season training, it was f***ing hard work, excuse my language. Trips up to up the Rapaki track and the trips through the Berber plantation and the sprints and the yeah, it was testing, shall I say. But good. Probably the greatest signing of all that was ever made by Christchurch United was Steve Sumner uh, coming out in 1973 and you know Steve was 17 years old at the time and you know I was a kid then of 12 and so we, we hero worshipped him because he didn't seem that much older than us. When he was picked up at the airport the guy Alec Wilson who was looking for Steve Sumner the 17 year old boy but Steve had long hair and he'd grown a beard because he thought the flight was going to be only a few hours, not realised it was a couple of days. And he was the last person left in the airport and Alec Wilson shouted out, Steve at the end of the day and the guy turned around, he couldn't believe it. He said, oh no, what have we brought into the country? Okay, when's the first game? And that was it, that was the first question. When's, when's, the, when's the first game? Good to meet you, when's the first game? He was a very strong, opinionated man. At 17, he wasn't a boy, he was a, he was a man. He could tackle, he could pass, he could score goals, he could defend, he could lead. He was the complete player. Right from the very first training session we ever had, he trained like he played hard. Kicked anything that moved. I can remember the very first training session and I thought I'd throw a move on him. I had plenty of moves in those days. He came up to me, he shouldered me in the chest, he threw his elbow out, he put his foot over the top of the ball, gave me one almighty shove, took the ball off me and that was that. And I went, okay. And this is how demented, if you want to call it, this is how crazy Steve used to be. We'd come back from a training session and if it wasn't a particularly hard training session, he'd have us out round Hadley Park and back again. And that's, that's, that's what we did. You have seven guys running down the road and all going flat. You know, Stevie used to just, when he ran, he just ran at 100 miles an hour and everybody had to keep up with him. He had to always go one better, mm -hmm. yeah. 
and he had to be at the front. There's no point. If you're going to be at the back, there's no point in running. <laughs> this was the heyday of football in New Zealand. As the sport grew in prestige, Christchurch United rode the wave to increasing success in both the league and the Chatham Cup. The 1972 Chatham Cup final is still considered to be the greatest Chatham Cup final of all times. Uh, it went over three legs. Christ United won a really tight third match. 2-1, Ian Park and Alan Marley got the goals and Christ United claimed their first ever trophy. Yeah, we won three in a row, I think, for memory. I, I, I think I've got four winners of Chatham Cup medals. It was the humming days of the Chatham Cup. I was 11 years old and uh, badgered my dad to take me down to the airport. There was a big crowd there to welcome them back and uh, see Ken France, the captain, get off the plane with the, holding up the Chatham Cup. But that really put them on the, uh, on the national pedestal, if you like. You know, that, that was the difference between now and then. Um, some of the games that we played and we, you go to 8th Street up in Auckland, you get 10, 12,000 people. We played Brighton down at QE2, one, one semi-final of the cup, I think it was. I scored, I remember. And I think there was about 15 or 16,000 at the game. So, I mean, we got crowds and the football was entertaining and high quality. It was, that's the difference. Football back then in the 70s had a, a lot of publicity. And Terry Connolly was one of the big reasons why. He was always in the paper, complaining about referees, complaining about officials who weren't up to standard. And everybody wanted to know what he had to say. That final is all over here at QE2 Park, and as you know, Christchurch United have beaten Wellington Diamond United by two goals to nil. With me in the radio car is coach for Wellington Diamond United, Bill Dumble. And uh, Bill, well, you'll be a wee bit disappointed you didn't take it away. I'm not disappointed then for the fact the way the team plays. I'm disappointed never won. And I'm going to say this now. Charlie Connolly's been rubbishing my team all season. He's rubbished right up to the final. And today I thought Charlie Connolly's English pros were rubbish, even though they won 2-0. Well, Terry, congratulations, and Christchurch United on top once again. Thank you, yes. 2-0, I suppose, when you look at the record book, isn't a great win over Wellington Diamond United. No, but in a cup final, 2-0 is, is a win, and that's all you want. Bad teams tend to lift up the game in, in cup finals. This wasn't really the case, Dick. We played in the first half and played very well, and we could have scored two or three goals. The defence was so bad. They're, they're a very, very bad defence, lack of organisation and discipline. I was very relieved when Brian Hardman did score, and it, I would like the goal to have come about 20 minutes early. Terry Conley's United team reached their zenith in 1975. They won the National League and concluded the season with an unforgettable Chatham Cup final against Auckland's Blockhouse Bay. But Norton, 25 metres out, almost stationary, flicking it to uh, Sumner, Sumner selling a dummy, going round the defence, turning a reverse run, it's going to spill on the net, is it? Oh, hits the post, but Norton scrambles it home, and it's goal number four for Christchurch United, with a very tired and demoralised Buckhouse Bay defence, and Christchurch United showing now that their win has been no fluke, they have run Blockhouse Bay into the ground, and Christchurch have scored again, but Norton will never get... An it's always hard after being successful, to keep on being successful. You know, it's, it's a roller coaster at times. And not every team's always going to be on the top every year. But things were starting to get a bit tricky uh, in the second half of the 70s when not only some of the players were getting on a bit, uh, but the Australian National League started in 77. So they started poaching more and more players from New Zealand. The New Zealand National League was very strong, but the Australian National League had a lot more money. So it was very interesting for a lot of players to leave. So Phil Dando, the goalkeeper, left early on, Roy Drinkwater, eventually Steve Sumner, and there was a whole bunch of other players that left as well. After 78, when they won the National League, that's when you could see a slow decline, and it took up till 87, till Christ United had rebuilt their new generation and started winning trophies again. <laughs> Thirty years after their peak, Christchurch United is once again creating momentum. And whilst the players, facilities and financial support are new, the personalities driving the club forward are loyal servants, many of whom were a big part of the Christchurch United glory days. It's been a um, tremendous year, really. You know, 
We won something like, if before we drew a game, we won 22 or 23 games in a row, or 21 games in a row, then we drew one. Danny's done some wonderful things. He's a hell of a coach. He's come here, he's brought players here, and within a short space of time, we've seen what it, you know a quality coach can do. I'm excited uh, for the children that are coming through this uh, football club, which has the facilities that can provide them with an opportunity to be professionally coached, to be able to take them to the next level. What we are about is that we want to play creative uh, football, intelligent football. The, the, the purpose of the academy is, is also just like the 70s, when, uh, when the, uh, the, the star players of the team were bringing up young Kiwis to uh, replace them later on. And the academy at the moment has that purpose as well, to make sure that all the young Kiwis have the opportunity to, uh, to grow into the first team. And we've got children at all ages, uh, from under nines through under 17s in the academy. And the long-term goal is to bring those kids through that academy that ultimately will come through and play in the first team. And hopefully some of them will be able to get professional contracts overseas because children in New Zealand are just as skillful as some other countries and they can certainly make it overseas. So we are working hard every day to improve our programs, to improve our trainings, to uh, enable the players to uh, chase their dreams. And those dreams are big, but the club's dreams are big as well. And as long as that goes hand in hand, uh, we will be successful again in the future. Football in New Zealand reached a new high when New Zealand qualified for the 1982 World Cup in Spain with 10 past or future Christchurch United players in the all-white squad. The team was led by Steve Sumner, who scored New Zealand's first ever goal at a World Cup against Scotland. The, the 82 World Cup led to a huge boost for, for soccer. It, it had been a high profile sport right through the 70s with the National League. The World Cup success gave it a boost to playing numbers, you know, a lot more juniors came into the sport. And if ever football was going to sort of maybe rival rugby, it was then because, you know, the Springbok Tour had alienated a lot of people from rugby. There were horrendous sort of neck injuries and things like that that were scaring mums off from letting their kids play rugby. And there was all this goodwill around the All-Whites in this amazing 15-game you know, trip to the World Cup Finals. In spite of the kick soccer got or the boost it got from reaching the finals in Spain, for quite a bit of the 80s, United as a club uh, was less successful. Um, they didn't win the National League for a while. They didn't win the Nash uh, Chatham Cup after uh, for, for some years. The the second real really gr great era for United came in the late 80s and early 90s when Ian Marshall took charge as coach. I can remember at Christchurch United having a, a a really good team, talented team, but some of the imports that we'd brought out hadn't really quite given us what we needed. You know and. Um, and during that lull, it was hugely frustrating. Um, but then one year it clicked again under Ian Marshall. Ian Marshall would be a guy that no one in Canterbury football would have had a bad word about. Yeah, he could be tough, but he was a he was a superb man man manager, if you like. You know, the team had been a bit demoralised before he took them over, um, but he basically galvanised them into a, a national force again. He very rarely raised his voice. He was always in control and calm, had good ideas about what to do, kept things really simple, and, um, and the boys just relished it. He was focused on the way the team gelled. Uh, he was interested in the character of players. He used to talk about that a lot. And I remember it being a, a period of great stability, so he would get the players that he wanted to be in the group uh, and stuck with them. He was very really loyal in that respect and expected the senior players to get on with it. You know, for instance, I remember we had a very settled side to the extent that keeper and back four, I think, one person missed one game over two seasons. That sort of stability, I think, was very much how Ian saw things working um, and that led to a period of success as well. Uh, Ian was a very good manager. The one thing he did do was sign Halligan and Carvel and Carvey scored goals left, right and centre. He was a good player. 
Alan Carvey, Carvey, still known as Carvey today, probably one of the most relaxed footballers <laughs> you, you, you'll ever meet in your life. Well, boy, could he play. Very clever player by moving away and taking people away and creating big gaps in defences, which luckily f fell for other people to score goals. Carvel was one of the better strikers that we, we've had at United over the years, even back when I was playing. The most awkward guy you've ever seen. Didn't look as though he could run. He was all over the place. He could score goals in ridiculous positions because he was so brave. You'd say, well, how the hell did he get there? And he'd score goals from different angles. He was just had the ability to be an exceptional player in those areas. One of the criticisms of Christchurch United was that they're a team full of English imports. Um, but they weren't. There was always there was always local, you know, good local players in there. But you know, the whole ethos was to get the local, the, the young local players, you know, the kids my age at that time to um, uh, to learn off these off these guys who had come from you know, professional clubs in the UK. In the second golden era from 87, 88 through to 91 to uh, more Kiwis. Um, so we learned from, and I certainly learned from those guys back in the 70s and, and these guys used to watch them play so they knew what they had to achieve, you know, what, where they had to get to. What, cha what changed was the attitudes of the younger guys. Their attitudes started to change. They had to get tougher, they had to get harder. If they didn't, basically they wouldn't be playing. But it, and it shows because you, the amount of players that came out of United, youth team and reserve team at that time, and it went on to play everywhere else in New Zealand, and they became very good successful players. Um, compared with today, it's, um, it's, it's an attitudinal thing. It was just a, an unbelievable pleasure playing with the Kiwis and winning. Um, Two totally different eras, but uh, both fantastic. Danny Halligan arrived and he changed the midfield because we had midfielders who were great players from England who could do all this and do all that, but Danny was a complete player. He was a complete midfielder. This is Nichols bringing the ball, plays it into Halligan, but he gives him a bit of work to do. I was 21 when I joined Christchurch United, which was quite late really for a, a player at that level. And I remember Ian Marshall saying to me, don't come and ask me any questions for a month. Don't ask me why you're not on the team. Just go away and work hard and see me in a month. So I thought, wow, that was a that was an interesting way about it, going about it. But I I now understand, you know, what it was all about. I had a lot of things I'd need to learn. Um, and the fascinating thing was, by the end of the year, I was in the All Whites team. With the addition of Halligan and Carville, Christchurch United were nearly unbeatable in 1987, with the meanest defence and the most prolific attack. They would win the league for the first time since 1978, prompting the young Halligan to ask his teammates what the problem had been. They'd had a lot of good players and they hadn't won for a number of years. And then these two or three young local lads turned up and we won it in the first year. First thing we said to them all was, you know, it wasn't that difficult, was it? Um, these were seasoned players who'd played for New Zealand for a long time and had had a bit of a, a lean run, but suddenly things fell together. Um, we won it in 1987 and we won it again in 1988. One of the things I'm most proud of in my career, funnily enough, is that I believe we still, we still hold the record for the least goals conceded. The defender would say this, but you know, a fairly important record, I think 14 in, in the season. And we went through a period where we just had a whole series of, of clean sheets and there was a real commitment you know, during that period around that, the midfielders balanced with Paul Nichols on one side, Johan Verwey on the other. Uh, we had Alan Carvel up front with John Hansen, both significant people in the team, really powerful in their own way, different sorts of players. We had two really uh, effective fullbacks, Paul Hillis and Kevin Calder. And I really enjoyed playing in the back three, Stratty behind us, but with Gary Lund. Each one of those players had particular purple patches. I remember when Gary Lund went through a period where he was just outstanding, the, the best player in the league in my view. Uh, an amazing you know, footballer and athlete, uh, wonderful in, in the air. Danny Halligan's athletic ability to get up and down and how that complemented Keith Braithwaite and his, his goal scoring now. Keith could pop the ball in from anywhere but he's a real goal grabber around the box. He once scored six goals from memory in a National League match in Palmerston North. It was a freezing cold day and we had the heaters on. Been out warming up. I come in, I'm, I'm soaked to the bone, covered in mud and things. And Carvel's sitting in the change rooms, hasn't even put his boots on. He's got his feet up in front of the heater reading the program. 
and that was his warm up. Gets out in the park and goes absolutely ballistic. On the day against Manawa 2, he laid three on the plate for me and he could have scored them himself. I was, I was sitting on five and he said, come and score your six, went down to keep it, held the ball there for a wee while and then as I got in the box, he just slipped it into me and uh, I was lucky enough that day to score six goals. Won the golden boot and we won the league, won that shield and yeah, that was a, a ma magic day. That, yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> Christchurch United were on a roll through the 1987 season, but dreams of another double were dashed by a familiar face. We knew we were in the Chatham Cup final, uh, but we'd drawn Gisborne in the... Oh, they had won through to this final as well, but three weeks before we'd played them in the last game of the National League and accounted for them quite easily, 3-0. Um, so we were very confident going into the game. But somebody had videotaped the game and uh, given it to Ian Marshall, who was the coach, and he presented it to Steve Sumner, who at that stage was the coach, player coach of Gisborne. And Keith and I were at the after match watching this and we went, what's he doing? What's he doing? He's giving them a tape of the game. They scored five goals and about three or four of them were from corners, set plays that he'd set up by watching this tape and figuring out how they could beat us and it worked wonderfully well for them. Winning the 1987 Chatham Cup was Sumner's farewell to Gisborne. By the start of the 88 season, he was back in the city where he felt he belonged. And he wasn't done with football yet. And what's that one there? Book. And that one. With his wife Jude and their three children, Steve Sumner is now back in Christchurch after spells in Auckland and Gisborne. Christchurch was always going to be home. He didn't want to move from here. Christchurch United was the club where his heart was, for sure. I will play as long as I'm physically possible. And, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the game just as much now as I did when I was, you know, 18, 19, so I don't see any reason to stop. With Sumner added to the squad, United was stronger again. He may have been a few years older, but Sumner's desire and passion to win remained unchanged. Fierce. So him and Danny Halligan were absolutely at each other the whole time. I can never forget my first training session with him. I think in the first five minutes he dropped me on my backside. Um, two minutes later again he just went straight through the back and he put me on my backside again and I sort of dusted myself off and all the players just watched and just smiled. Um, and after the third time he'd done it, um, I thought I'm not going to tolerate this. So I had to go back at him and he just turned around, shook my hand and said, welcome fella, well done. For us it was important to go back to back, so rather than you know, having a few years of struggle and then managing to do it once, actually going back to back was a, you know, setting us apart from the sides that just managed to do it once. Last weekend Christchurch picked up their second successive title. Mike McRoberts spoke with Ian Marshall and asked him about his winning formula. Well I think we've got a good side basically. That's. That's the most important thing. If you don't have the players, it doesn't matter what kind of coach you are, you won't do it. No, it's an old saying, but it's a fact that, you know, coaches really are only as good as the players they have. But you've always maintained this thing about uh, having a happy team. In any sporting environment, unless you've got a happy side, the players can't perform at their best. And another thing that we're quite proud of is the fact that our discipline is good and that uh, we've now almost reached the end of the season with just the Champ Cup final to go. We've not had one player who served one day's suspension. We were chasing the double again. We got to the final against Waikato, two all at home, one all away. They won on away goals count double. That was another horrible loss. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was, uh, we just couldn't get over the hurdle with that. You know, we were winning, winning trophies, but we just couldn't do the double. The losses just kick you on a wee bit, you know, and you think, well, I'm not gonna let that happen again. Twice was enough. <laughs> the 1989 season would be a reverse of the previous two. United were well off the pace in the league, but would not let another crack at the Chatham Cup pass them by. It took Christchurch United in blue just 10 minutes to set the alarm bells ringing in the rotary defence. McGarry to Braithwaite, and it's 1-0. Him on, chips the ball across, and it's there! Hillis with the free kick, McGarry finds a bit of space in the box, and the finish is all class. A few minutes later, he got his second. Halligan again spots young Mark McGarry, and it's 3-0. Sets the ball up for McGarry. And McGarry 3-0. Across, 
and here's, here's Braithwaite. It could be four. He's left himself. Burry squeezes in number four. Christchurch players were always in lots of space, always unchallenged. Fitzpatrick waltzes into shooting range and makes it 5 0 at half time. Braithwaite to Verwe, a back flick to Steve Sumner, and Christchurch was on to beat a 7 1 Chatham Cup record set in 58. Number seven gave McGarry's hat trick after Verwe hits the post. Harris has committed himself, here's Verwe, and he hits the post, surely McGarry. And it's 7 0. And the Chatham Cup goes back to Christchurch for the first time since 1976. And returned to an ecstatic reception at Christchurch Airport. No, we didn't, you know, we were confident we were going to win, but 7-1, um, you know, that's, that's really a bit too much, isn't it? We were pleased to do it in style. Some of the shots were magnificent. Oh. Great, yeah, we could go back again tomorrow. We enjoyed it so much. Um, and Ian took the team for three years, and during that time we won the National League twice. Um, and then Ian had the opportunity to coach the national team, which obviously he, he took. Um, and Martin Stewart took over the team um, after those three years and in 1990. Um, but then he started to bring in some younger, newer players, which we needed to do. We had a mixture of the old fellas like myself, Paul Hillis, Johan Vary, and then all the young local lads that Martin developed. We worked our socks off and we worked for each other on and off the pitch. And on the pitch, if somebody done something, we'd give them a bit of a rollicking, but then we'd get right behind them and they'd be back on it. You know, players like Kevin Calder, they were good, solid, honest players. Mike Fullan, Danny Hallingham would work and run his socks off for everybody. And the likes of myself, I was getting on then, I didn't have the legs, but I talked and, and organised people around us. And we had a great time on and off the field. There's nothing better than scoring goals and winning games. And once you get in that mentality in football, it just goes from strength to strength. 91 was probably the most successful year where there were possibly five trophies up for grabs and we won them all. There had been very little in it for the first half, but 30 seconds from the break, DB Wellington's defence faltered. He's on his left foot and he scored! Then Alan Evans scored his second, a beautiful ball bending past the keeper. Beautifully bent. You know, there was the National League, there was a Chatham Cup, there was a, a, a Renfrewly Shield style trophy that they had, there was a top five playoff that was, and we won them all. So we, were, we were hot favourites to win the league and the Chatham Cup, but to actually have done it, great way to sign off um, my National League days with, with Christchurch United. It's great, great, great feeling. Amazing era. Yeah, 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 it was. It was. 1991 would be the end of a golden era for Christchurch United. The National Football League would fold after one more season, and Christchurch United would not have the opportunity to experience that level of success again. After six league titles and six Chatham Cup victories, the end of the league was a blow to the club and the sport, which had progressed so much over two decades. I think it's done tremendous things for the game in New Zealand. Um, we get probably three, four hundred kids that charge onto the park after every game. This was unheard of before Rotherham's National League started. It's helped the game, so the game is definitely improving. There's no two ways about that, and that is thanks to National League. New Zealand Football Association were the first sporting body to, to have a national competition, and then after that, basketball all started to sort of follow suit. Uh, so they were pioneers. They had that pioneering spirit, a bit like the guys who set up Christchurch United, and, um, and then the administrators at national level lost a bit of that pioneering spirit. Players were getting good offers from all over the city to go and join other clubs. We all wanted to stay at Christchurch United and I sort of led the boys got together and said what would be fair and we came up with a, a happy medium which was probably a lot less than a lot of players were getting offered and put that to the club to say you give us this we'll all stay and we thought it was really reasonable but the club um, I know, I know now they were in a serious some difficulties with finance so we sort of scattered, mm. yeah. Christchurch United was simply playing in the, in the local um, premier competition and 
it was a completely different scene of some young lads who were um, simply just club footballers um, and didn't really have great ambitions and there probably wasn't an opportunity for them. You know, it was, uh, they were a wee bit in the, in the wilderness in terms of where to from here and um, still training in the same place down at Sprayden Domain. Um, but you know, we were no longer playing against the likes of Mount Wellington or Gisborne or Nelson Suburbs. We were simply playing club football and um, yeah, it was, it was a, dif a difficult and interesting time. Christchurch United would survive through the loyalty and perseverance of volunteers, supporters and characters such as Terry Conley and Danny Halligan. The glory days were over, but the club continued to produce some of New Zealand's best players. Players like Ryan Nelson and Ben Sigmund, who would go on to recreate the magic of the 1982 World Cup squad. Delivers to the far post, headed away by Ryan Nelson from right in front of his own goal. Great work too from Sigmund. Good initiative from Ben Sigmund there. Bertos, chance goal! Goal New Zealand! It is all over! The first day at uh, Croatia night, I can remember um, my father driving up to Spray to Maine, I was, must be about five years old, and literally literally kicking me out of the, uh, the car in disgust because he was a rugby guy and mum had won the argument. So I spent from like five to, you know, I spent probably what, 15, no, 7, 12, 13, 14 years playing at Croatia United. I think I must have been about 15, I think, at the time, and it was straight into the first team squad, but it was with some. Um, there's some hard-ass players, like these guys were, um, you know, um, Glenn Mitchell, w Willie Duncan, I think it was, yeah, and Halim Gore. Um, so yeah, it was just playing alongside those guys who just, you know, knew how to hit the ball and knew how to defend and traditional defending and loved that battle. And it was one of the biggest educations you could possibly get. Every level I always thought was out of my reach, it was a bit too scary. No matter which level it was, I'd, I'd be nervous and insecure, and I, or, but I'd get over the line and get on the football field. And for some reason, I just thought I was the best in the world. I just, just literally thought I was the best. And that nobody's going to beat me. And then I'd get back off it, and then I'd go back into this little fragile kind of state. Um, but I think when, when I look back, I think the uh, the failures that I've had, I've failed so many times and I've made so many mistakes. Um, probably kicked me on to be better, where I think maybe for a lot of people it, it knocks them back and it's hard for them to get over that, where I think for me it motivated me more. The initial thing that struck me about Ryan was he was so mature and he listened and he knew the game back to front and he was prepared to do whatever was required to make it at a high level. Isn't it? Five years of it, I'm just burnt it's out. Over. Ben was a wild, rough, young rooster um, and it's very similar to Ryan, could play equally well off both feet um, and a player who can do that is a special talent. I, I, like I was a hothead, you know, like, and that was because I loved to win, but Danny knew I loved to win, I hated losing, but I'd lose my temper every now and then, you know, um, we were playing uh, North Shore United and a guy called Tim Stevens come and kind of tackled me to the ground in the first five minutes. And I was so annoyed at this, and so I just would turn around and just went whack and dropped Tim Stevens on the ground. And I always remember Danny Helling going, like, no, like, what are you doing? And I, I've always got this vision of Danny going, mate, what have you done? And I got sent off uh, within the first five minutes, you know, and um, they ended up drawing one all. But Danny was, Danny was always on my shoulder trying to better me and help me, you know, be that calming influence, but every now and then I, I, I flicked and <laughs> let them down. <laughs> but they never ever stopped me from trying to be me, um, and they just let me go and just express myself. And um, you know, they, they were fantastic for my senior years. I, I, I truly believe that the English players came out and taught the New Zealand players, really. You know, no one got past them, no one beat them in the year, they were always winning things in the year. You know, I'm, I've still got that old school mentality, you know, like whatever you were doing, training, work hard, play hard, you know, I carried through and, I, and I'm so thankful and grateful to all those guys and 
I can now say you know, I went professional, played for my country, went to World Cup, you know, so it's pretty nice to be able to sit there and say that, you know. After Nelson, Sigmund and Halligan won the 1998 Mainland Premier League title, the fortune started to change. After playing their entire history in the top tier, the club suffered its first relegation to the second tier in 2006. It got, when it when started to go down a wee bit, I struggled with getting players. There was a bit of money with other clubs and it continued for Christchurch United being a bit of a downtime. Um, and it has done for quite a while. Um, and then all of a sudden, this year things have changed dramatically. We didn't have nothing like this in my childhood. No proper shoes, no proper balls, and of course, no facilities like this. And uh, it is my dream that kids in this day can play in this environment. We arrived uh, to Krajcic in 2009. I was really surprised that in New Zealand we play football only during winter time, maybe not more than five months. Yeah, and uh, I was surprised and I started to think immediately how, how we could find a way to play all year round. And we started this project, we opened uh, Krajcic Football Academy in 2014. But unfortunately, by local rules, uh, we can't be part of a uh, football family. Because by local rules, you can't create new football club. Impossible. Impossible. And three years in a row, we were like illegal structure. <laughs> but it is true. At the final, we find mutual uh, goal and understanding with Krajcic United. And I know that Krajcic United FC most uh, regarded and uh, very, very well-known club in New Zealand already, with a lot of great players who play, and they, they've got a lot of titles. And we made agreement, we just merged Academy and Krajcic United because they, they didn't have youth academy structure, but they had great, great history of first team. And now, three years in a row, we work together, we're developing our club. We almost built full academy structure. Maybe next year we'll fulfill 100% uh, full academy structure from under 6 till under 19. Because our ultimate goal at Krajic Football Academy, Krajic United Football Academy, is uh, to develop individual players. It is what we try to explain our parents. It is great to score, it is great to win, but much more important that after each game, after each training, your kid learns something and became better. Became better footballer, became better human. <laughs> nice, nice. No, I don't go into anything unless I think I'm going to succeed. Um, but the success that we had in the first season is beyond my expectations. Um, you, know, you think every team at the start of the year thinks they're going to win the league because that's what coaches say. Um, but to have dominated the competition this year um, the way we have is, really has exceeded my expectations. But we've got aspirations to be to uh, not only to get into the full National League in New Zealand but our ultimate goal is to play in the A-League and that's the Australian competition. That's where we want to be and that's, we're focused on that. Uh, and we'll progress and win our way to that position. So, yep, we won't give up until we get there. The one thing you see here now with Christchurch United is that Slava uh, has a, a goal, has a plan, wants to get there. If we could get two or 3,000 people going and watch the game, that's success. You know, because it's all still about the game. It's about football. And that's what it is. And Slava's got a love of football. So good on him. Watching from afar, I know a lot of people have all sorts of thoughts of what's going on here, but um, it's quite simple. He's, he's happy to invest his own money to improve opportunities for young people. It is joy to be part of the team, do you know? It is joy 
to reach success not yourself, but together with your partners. I think that is what football and team sports provide. This, this uh, feeling that you belong, you belong to the organization, you belong to the team. You, you could reach many success in individual sport, it is great, it is, yeah, it is extremely difficult. But to reach success together with your friends, I think it is even bigger. <laughs> We've got a great heritage here and um, you know, the club has, has won a lot in the past but that's past and these, this group of players now have the opportunity to, to build their own momentum and, and their own legacy.